Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 21. Matthew, chapter number 21. There, I'm going to read the first 11 verses. <clears throat> the first 11 verses. This is traditionally called Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, the Passover week. So we're going to start reading at verse 1. It says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with a coat by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a coat, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the coat, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth, in Galilee. This morning I want to use this text and talk about this thought. Don't cheapen your Hosanna. Don't cheapen your Hosanna. Around February, around the second week or so, second or third week in February, in some city in this nation every year, some city will have the pleasure of celebrating their team for winning the Super Bowl. Some city, this past year, this year, it was the city of New York, as they celebrated their New York Giants victory in the Super Bowl over the New England Patriots. Yet again, it was another feat of what they believed to be David defeating Goliath. And the city was electric and businesses were shut down and the streets were sectioned off and the ticker tape was flowing and the team was riding on the fire engines and all of that. They were waving at the crowds and there was a euphoric atmosphere as everybody cheered on their team. And, you know, since I have this opportunity, keep praying, you Detroit Lions fans, one day you will get to see what that feels like. You're getting close. You're getting close. Being the cowboy fan that I am, let me tell you firsthand, it is all of what it looks like on television. It, that's really how it is. But, but the fans are out there. The city is out there. Everybody's out there cheering on their team, celebrating. People take off from work and People hang out the windows and people are, some people don't even like football, but they just want to be caught up in the atmosphere. They just love a crowd. They love the fanfare. They love all of that. They want to take full advantage. But as, as electric as the atmosphere is, the celebration is always short lived. Because I promise you, come August, September, when the next season starts, the New York Giants will falter somewhere along the way and there will be boos from the stands and they will forget the parade that happened in February. And I promise you that as successful as the Detroit Lions were on this past season, come August, September, October, somewhere along the journey, there will be boos coming from the stands and you could care less about the success in 2012 because you will see failure at some point along the journey in this upcoming season. And the point I'm making here is that we see an electric atmosphere in the scripture. We see Jesus making his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem he is a days away from his coronation. 
days away from his inauguration as they will hoist him up on his throne and they will hail him as the king of the Jews and everybody's all excited and the crowd is is going crazy and the people are are throwing their clothes into the street they've laid their clothes on a coat because their king has come in to the city of Jerusalem their king enters in you all have palms this morning wave those palms pick up your palms this morning and and just wave them in the air wave your palms in there they were crying out hosanna lord save us hosanna they were waving those palms now when the service is over make sure you take your palm with you out of the sanctuary and you all keep them palms up keep them up because if you see somebody with a palm in their hand after the benediction make sure you still see it in their hand no palm is supposed to be left here but they were crying out Hosanna. They were praising the goodness and they were praising the power, the pageantry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hosanna was not a name of Jesus. Don't, you know, there are people who get that all mixed up thinking that Hosanna is the name of God. No, Hosanna was a cry of patriotism. It was equivalent to the European expression, Lord or God bless the Queen. Oh, it's no different from us waving our star-spangled banner, our stars and stripes. They were waving these palm branches, crying out, Hosanna. But do you realize that in just a few days, some of the same people who said, Hosanna, also said, crucify him. Some of the same people who were praising him on Sunday as he came down that windy road into the city of Jerusalem. Some of those same people were there at the cross and some of them were outside of the of the guard, outside of the gates the night before saying, we want Barabbas, free Barabbas and saying, crucify Jesus, crucify him. How dare they praise him on Sunday and order his crucifixion on Friday night. And I want us to appreciate this text today that while we wave our Hosanna branches on this day, don't allow your praise to be cheapened by the wrong attitude, a misunderstanding, ignorance. Don't be caught up in the crowd. Don't be caught up in the electricity. Don't get caught up in the praise and miss the celebration. Don't get caught up in the noise and don't just be making noise and your heart be far from what God is really doing. And so as we, can I, can I preach this for a few minutes? That Jesus has come into the city to raise the level of consciousness because they didn't even realize what was going on. But when Jesus comes in, he's got an agenda all of his own. He is a secure in himself. He knows that he's the king. He doesn't need a big white horse and a chariot of fire. He'll come in on a donkey and he's still the king. But if we had scripted it our own way, we wouldn't have our king coming in on a donkey. Our king wouldn't be coming in at the fanfare of peasants, but our king would have had soldiers out before him. Our king would have demanded that the city be shut down. Our king, but Jesus comes in his own way. And I need us to understand now as we approach the Easter season that we not allow our Hosanna praise to go cheap. And so let me help you understand what I'm talking about. That it was a short-lived celebration. And so this first point is this, that we cannot be self-serving in our celebration. But you see, when Jesus was coming in, everybody was running out. Everybody was getting their praise on. Hosanna, Hosanna, here come my king. Here come Jesus. Here come Jesus. They all out in the crowd. Everybody, I got my palm. I got my palm. Wave those palms again. Wave those palms again. I got my palm. I got my palm. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. I got my, you know, and when we get ready for the parade, we get our outfits together. We get our stuff together because it's all about us. We want to be a part of the atmosphere. We want to be a part of the electricity. We want to be a part of the stuff. We want to be a part of the celebration. But when Jesus comes, he comes in humility. When he comes, he does not come looking for attention. When he comes, he is not impressed by the crowds. When he comes, he is not impressed by what they have to say because he too knows that though I'm up today, Jesus knew what was going to happen on Friday. Jesus knew that it was high praise on Sunday, but on Friday they were going to be talking about crucify him. 
Jesus knew that he could do no wrong on Sunday. But come Friday, he would be despised. And we too get like that, that that certain days of the week, somebody can do no wrong because everything is going our way. But one day when the rain starts falling in our lives, we start saying stuff like, where is God? And why didn't God do this? And why didn't God do that? We might as well say, crucify him. See, we can say when the weather's good, God is good all the time. And all the time is good. God is good. But when the bottom falls out of our lives, Lord, where are you? How long, Lord, will you forsake me? How long, God, will my enemies rage over me? And so when we see here, Jesus came knowing that he was king. But he wasn't coming for his own glory. He wasn't coming that he could just be king and be crowned and be seated on a throne. But he came with an agenda for somebody else. Our praise of him must not be strictly the celebration of our own deliverance. You see, when we sometimes when we praise, we get very uh, self-absorbed in our praise. Then we start making our praise be about the blessing. Rather than our praise be about God. You see, y- y'all, not, y'all not follow me yet. We, we want to praise the Cadillac. Rather than praising the God who made provision. We want to praise the healing. Rather than praising the God of the healing. We want to praise the promotion. And we'll cry tears of joy that we got promoted. Oh, I got delivered. I'm finally free of that. And now I get my own office. Now I get a car allowance. Now I get this and now I get that. It's going to be better in my life. Now, now I get to go to Outback for dinner. Now I get to go to Root Chris for dinner. Now I get to shop at Saks Fifth Avenue. Now I get to wear this and do this and drive that. And if we aren't careful, we will forget that if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side sometimes we lose sight of that and we make the blessing bigger than the God of the blessing sometimes we get so caught up in the trappings and the trimmings of our lives the trivial things that we forget that it was nobody but the hand of God who has carried us all of this way and so you cannot let your celebration be self-serving Praise may seem to be therapeutic, but genuine praise will seek to honor God and God alone. You know, we make statements like, I need to come get my praise on. As if praise is some kind of holy spiritual calisthenic that we could burn sinful calories and think that praise will make us better and so the praise still will be about us I gotta praise so I can feel better I gotta praise so I can do this I gotta praise so I can do that I gotta praise so I can do this I gotta praise because the devil's on my back I gotta praise because she's getting on my nerves I gotta praise because I need a breakthrough I gotta praise because I gotta get my way out of this I gotta praise my way out praise my way under praise my way through praise for me praise me this praise me that but praise ought to be about God and when I think about the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me my soul ought to get happy but I can't get happy over my stuff without thinking about God it was nobody but God who woke me up this morning nobody but God who started me on my way nobody but God who made a way out of no way nobody but God who lets you wave them palms in the air nobody but your hat fit straight on your head nobody but God is able to hold you and keep you he never slumbers nor does he sleep he watches you overnight he keeps you from falling he has saved you to the utmost and therefore when we praise I am praising the God of heaven can I get a witness in here today that our God is worthy of our praise however Don't let your praise be about you. Don't let your praise call attention to you. Your praise ought to call attention to him. There's a fine line there. Where your praise can turn into entertainment. Or you can be, don't be arrogant in your praise. Don't be, don't choreograph your praise. You know, don't, don't, don't. 
Don't tell people to move out of the way because it's your song. For you to get your praise. Because if it was genuine, it ought not take a certain song to make you go in. You know, if you, you really think about it, you know, God can, you know, we talk about it's time for a miracle. And we were crazy over that. God is working miracles. Yes, he is. But God is also faithful. And you can go in on great as our faithfulness just as easy as you can on God working out a miracle. Because you do know now that the activity of your limbs is a miracle. Being able to say amen is a miracle. Inhale and exhale, that's a miracle. Touch your neighbor, that's a miracle. Our God is still working miracles, amen? Amen, but listen, 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 let's move on here. You cannot be self-serving in your celebration but look at this one. <clears throat> we cannot celebrate the crown and despise the cross. See, they were all caught up in the kingship. They were all caught up in the king is coming. And so with the king coming, they're looking at, oh yeah, Jesus is coming. We got a king now. Ain't no more Roman oppression standing on our necks. Now the king is here. Now we will get what is rightfully ours. No longer subservient behavior. No longer becoming a second, second class citizen. The king is here. They were celebrating his arrival. And his arrival would mark the end of Roman authority and oppression in their lives. It would mark the end of extortion. It would mark the end of their children being taken into captivity. It would mark the end of their heritage being defamed and desecrated. They would finally get their temple back. They would have their high priest. They would have their king and they would be a nation of dignity again. They would be a nation of superiority. They would be a nation that could boast and brag again that we are God's chosen people. And the Lord God Jehovah shall fight for us. And therefore you will bow down to our God because there is no other God like our God. In fact, that our God is the God of all gods and he reigns supreme in the universe. And we are his people. Therefore we are superior. They want to celebrate the crown. And we get like that in our own celebration. But you see, this is a scene of contradictions. Jesus comes in as a king and they're thinking life, but he's anticipating death. Jesus comes in as a king and they're thinking great white horse, chariots of fire, and he's thinking a donkey. Jesus comes in as a king and they're thinking riches and glory, a palace and a throne, and Jesus sees an old rugged cross. Jesus comes in as king and they're thinking now that they will have rule, reign and superior, superiority and Jesus is thinking now a borrowed tomb, a series of contradictions but how easy it is to praise God in Christ for salvation and glory and completely miss the fact that Jesus says that if anyone should come after me, let him first deny himself take up his cross and follow me see we love to talk about the crowns but nobody wants to appreciate the cross but the bible says jesus himself says in this world you will have tribulation but be of good cheer for i have overcome the world the bible says jesus tells us that there are no exemptions from your suffering that everybody in here, we are all subject to some level of suffering in our lives. How many times have we charged God foolishly because it started to rain in our lives and we felt like we did not deserve it? Don't think that just because you got enough sense to call Jesus your Lord that you can't have trouble in your life. Christians get cancer. Christians go through divorce. Christians lose their children. Christians endure rape. 
Christians endure suffering. Christians endure sickness. Christians endure pain. Christians endure heartache. Do I have a witness in here? We got a church full of saved folk, but you know you got trouble on every side. You got people biting your back. You got people talking about you. You got people running your name in the dirt. You got a spouse who won't love you. You got children who won't honor you. You got a church that won't esteem you. You got people that won't affirm you. You got people that dash your dreams and your hopes. You got a doctor that says he can't do nothing for you. You got a body that won't cooperate with you. You got pain in your life and yet you still belong to God. There can be no crown with no cross. Therefore, I tell you right now today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that I wish and I so hurt for every person who's in bondage who believes now that if they have pain in their lives, they believe it because it's a problem with them. But I tell you, my brother, my sister, don't lose hope because even though you may have cancer in your body, God still keeps your soul. That the Lord still knows how to heal you. And there's a big difference between being healed and being cured. My body may fail, but I know that my soul shall live forever. I know that I may have some pains in my body, but David said I once was young, but now I'm old and I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Can I get a witness in here? Anybody know that the Lord will make a way out of no way? Anybody know that God knows how to take care of you? Has anybody seen the invisible hand of God at work in your life? Anybody know that God knows how to hover over the seas, part the waters, and make it rain in your life? Because God is a good God. Hey! Our God. Our God, sovereignty and power is not threatened by heartache and pain. Our God is not overwhelmed by the calamity that strikes in our lives. The psalmist declares that our God is a very present help in times of trouble. Even though the earth give way, still God is God. God knows how to hold us and keep us. And so therefore, therefore, we celebrate his crown, but we can also celebrate our cross. In fact, we know that by, by virtue of the fact that we are in Christ, we too are crucified with him. But therefore, it's not I that live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Therefore, even though I carry this cross, it's reminding me of the constant death in my body. But I still know that I also walk in resurrection power. I know that life may sometimes get the best of me, but still there is a power inside of me. There is the spirit of God that dwells inside of me. Therefore, I still don't look as bad as I should look. And I thank God that I don't look like what I used to look like. And I don't look like what I've been through. But God has been too good to me. And God has brought me through too much. And therefore, I will not renounce him. I will not turn my back on him. I will keep my hand in his hand. I will walk with him. I will trust him. I will let him fight my back battles i will let him continue to make a way out of no way because he is that kind of god no cross no crown therefore don't find yourself despising the crosses in your life and yet celebrating the crowns because the cross comes with the crown church the cross comes with the crown and then this other thing here we cannot miss the real reason for his coming. See, everybody was there. They were, they were all out there in the crowd. Everybody was out there and they were thinking strictly about Jesus coming to kick butt and take names. They was anticipating the day. You, you, you know how you look at people when you think, that's right, I'm, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. You know, when somebody cross you and you know that a time is coming when you will have the upper hand. You know when somebody, you know like you know how you get when people on your job when they when they try to try to act like they're better than you, but you know the promotion is coming. You know that they're gonna be reporting to you at some point, 
and you know, you just kind of chuckle with him, but you think, yeah, I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. But, but see, Jesus doesn't want you to miss the purpose for his coming. You see, he comes to liberate, but they're only thinking about a political and physical liberation. They're anticipating the opportunity now to buy and purchase land. They're anticipating the opportunity now to worship freely. They are now anticipating the opportunity to be regarded as full standing citizens with all of the rights and privileges. They are anticipating the opportunity to have the restoration of their heritage, their kingdom, their people. They are anticipating being returned to their former glory. They're going to be liberated. But Jesus does come to bring that kind of liberation, but that's only surface level. Jesus understood that the chains of Roman oppression are not the chains that are the tightest chains in your life. Jesus knows that the bigger chains in your life are the chains of sin and damnation. Jesus understands that as long as you are a sinner, all of your blood offerings and your guilt offerings and your grain offerings are still insufficient to make you worthy of the Lord God's presence. Jesus says you got a bigger problem than Herod and, and Caesar and all of these Roman people. Your bigger problem are the forces of darkness that are at work all around around you. Paul says we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities darkness and evil in high places there is a cosmic conflict and battle that rages all around us even right now just because you in the sanctuary does not mean that there's not a war going on for your soul but Jesus has come now so that while you are in this battle even though you have to fight you still have victory because Jesus has now have taken back what belongs to God and therefore Jesus has stood in our place and so Jesus says y'all don't even know why you praising me right now y'all don't even know why you lifting me up and hailing me right now yes I am your king yes I will wear a crown yes I will have a throne but the crown I wear will be the crown that was intended for you the throne that I sit on will be the throne that was fitted for you and the tomb that I will lay in should be the tomb that was carved out for you. But thanks be to God. Jesus said, I'll go for them. God said, I'm tired of the blood of bulls. I'm tired of the blood of pigeons. I'm tired of empty sacrifices. I'm tired of thankless offerings. God said, I'll take care of myself. And so 33 years previous to this point, God got inside of a baby and God walked around planet Earth and God opened up blinded eyes God raised up sick people God raised up dead children God opened up doors that nobody can open God brought out Lazarus from the grave but God knew that Jerusalem was going to come and so finally God said now it's a party now I have arrived now the Messiah is here and so now you will have liberty and now you will no longer be bound by your sin there's a song and he says that I once was sinking deep in sin far from the peaceful shore very deeply stained within sinking to rise no more but the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters he lifted me now saved am I anybody saved out there anybody delivered out there anybody know you've been redeemed out there you have been bought by the blood of the Lamb. Don't miss his coming, church. Don't be celebrating everything that happens on earth. And forget about what happens in eternity. Don't be celebrating the fact that the Lord gave you a new job. Don't be celebrating the fact that the Lord finally gave you a spouse. Don't celebrate the fact that God finally got your credit straight. You ought to celebrate the fact that the Lord canceled your debt. That God canceled your debt of sin. That God has delivered you from the penalty and the power of sin. That you are no longer bound by your sinful condition. But you do realize that as fine as you are and as handsome as you are, apart from the blood of Jesus Christ, you are still worth nothing. But the only thing that gives your life value today is the blood of the Lamb. 
Don't tell me who the designer is of your clothes. I'm going to tell you made by God, covered by his blood. Don't tell me where you shop at. I'm going to tell you I shop out of God's closet. And it's one size fits all. I didn't have to lose weight to get in it. I didn't have to apply for it. I didn't have to have nobody co-sign for it. I just accepted the free gift of salvation. And I am free indeed. The Bible says he who the son sets free is free indeed. You can call up my past, but the God says saved. You can call up my drug addiction, but God says saved. You can call up my divorce, but God says saved. You can call up my children out of wedlock, but God says saved. You can call up my bad credit history, but God says saved. You can call up everything I did last year, but God says saved. That's why he came, church. And so here's my last little point. I'm going to my seat. It is this, that we must always declare his presence and reign. While they were marching. While they were coming into Jerusalem. When you get some time, go over to Luke chapter, around uh, chapter 19. Go over there and read the same account. And they talk about waving these branches of Hosanna. But Luke records an interesting point. Luke says the Pharisees call out to Jesus and the Pharisees said, Jesus, tell your disciples to close their mouths. Jesus, tell your disciples to hush their mouths. Jesus, tell this crowd to cut out all of this foolishness. They're making too much noise. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said that if they shut up, even the rocks will cry out. The Pharisees said, Jesus, tell these people to cut out all this noise. And Jesus said, well, if I tell them to be quiet, it won't be quiet. Because I'm the king and the king is here. And when the king is here, everybody got to acknowledge my coming. You can silence the voices of men, but if you do that, then God will just make the rocks cry out about my glory. Church, I need you to understand today that nobody ought to shout the name of the Lord louder than those who have been redeemed by him. But we got folk in the sanctuary. You might as well be an old rock, an old lump on the log. But God is not worried about you still. God knows, you know what, she can be a rock all she wants. But she cannot deny my godness, my power, and my might. She can sit there locked up all she wants, but she will give me my glory. Because Jesus said, even the rocks will cry out. But I'm going to tell you now that a rock can't tell my story. A rock can't tell you what the Lord has done for me. Can't nobody tell me what God has done. But I can tell you that God is my God. That God is my salvation. That God is my light. That God is my shepherd. That God is my redeemer. That God is my healer. That God is my heavy load bearer. That God is my wheel in the middle of the wheel. That God is my rose of Sharon. Can I get a witness in here? Say yeah! now can't nobody out tell this story can't nobody tell this story with greater conviction than I can because this is my story and you are not letting nobody else out tell you can't nobody tell nobody else how good God has been to you but you don't let me praise for you and don't let the choir praise for you see the choir wasn't there when God saved me the choir wasn't there when the God watched over my life the choir wasn't there when God covered me with his blood. But you know what? When they praise, I can praise too. I can join right in with them. I might not know the lyrics, but I know the song. I might not know the rhythm, but I know God. 